today's program. I'm a certified docent at the museum, so I'm looking forward to answering whatever questions you come up with. More about that as we continue. The Carcomi Holocaust Exhibition at the Illinois Holocaust Museum is a place where both those familiar with the Holocaust and those learning about it for the first time can experience pre-war European life, the rise of Nazism, ghettoization, concentration camps, liberation, and resettlement around the world through more than 500 artifacts, documents, photographs, and an authentic German rail car of the type used in Nazi deportations. Our museum, our exhibit has a special focus on post-war life in Skokie, Illinois, which has the largest per capita population of Holocaust survivors outside of Israel, and which actually sparked the museum's eventual creation. For those not familiar with our museum, we are the world's third largest Holocaust museum, largest is in Israel, second largest is in Washington, DC, and we're located in Skokie, Illinois, about 17 miles north northwest of downtown Chicago. Our museum is founded by local Holocaust survivors with the mission of remembering the past and transforming the future. You can learn more about us by visiting us online. I will be posting some information about that as we continue. Between me and Kate, we'll get you all the information you need for how to learn more, how to contact more about the museum. We also ask, as Kate mentioned, after the tour, fill out a survey, we'll be making a link available to you for doing that. That will help us improve our virtual group tour experience and help us secure funding that supports our mission. So thank you for all that. Logistics for today, our program is broken into four parts, followed after each part by a few moments for questions and answers. On the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A icon. If you have a question or comment at any time during the presentation, you can send them using this Q&A feature, typing in your comment there. Our tour will begin shortly with the description of the world of Europe's Jews before the Nazi rise to power. We'll meet several people along the way, hear their stories, see how their world changed, and how they resisted and responded to the incremental changes to their lives. The way we're doing these four segments is we have four videos prepared by our exhibit curator, narrated by one of our directors, and the director will be providing some thought-provoking open-ended questions for you to consider. I'll also display some for you right now. Some general questions. What surprised you? What caught your attention? What questions do you still have? And how do you think the people in the stories will be telling? might have felt. For our first segment, some of the questions you might find yourselves asking or thinking about, what was life like for Jewish people before World War II? Why did life start to change? How did they meet the challenges? What are some ways they chose to resist? Why do you think some chose to leave Germany and why did others choose to stay? Do you think this was an easy decision to make? Think about why or why not. And I hope these questions will help you get the most you can out of these presentations. So with that, let's begin our video presentation of part one. Sometimes it takes a few seconds to get going. Here it comes. Hello, and welcome to your virtual group tour of the Illinois Holocaust Museum's Carcomi Holocaust Exhibition. 
My name is John Davis. I'm on the board of directors for the museum. On this tour, you will be introduced to a number of Holocaust survivors who made their homes in the Chicago area. You'll learn about upstanders who made a choice to help others, as well as bystanders who stood by and chose not to get involved. Along the way, you will see the impact that people, world leaders, and everyday citizens can have on the world around them by the choices they make. As we begin our tour, we will get a glimpse of what life was like for Jewish families in Europe before the Holocaust began. As we begin our tour, we get a glimpse of what life was like for Jewish families in Europe before the Holocaust began. Families lived not so differently from their non-Jewish neighbors. They got married and raised families, celebrated holidays, had jobs, and took vacations. For assimilated Jewish families in Germany, they considered themselves Germans who were also Jewish. Among more traditional Jews in Eastern Europe, their Jewishness was much more central to their identities and separated them physically and culturally from their non-Jewish neighbors. Adam and Pella Starkov, shown here in their wedding photo, were childhood sweethearts in Warsaw, Poland. They attended Warsaw University, where Adam studied accounting and Pella studied law. They had a happy life in Warsaw and did not experience very much anti-Semitism before the war began. We will learn more about them later in the tour. The origins of the Holocaust began much earlier, with Germany's defeat in World War I. Germany had been the most powerful country in the world, with the strongest military, and people could not understand how they had lost. The Treaty of Versailles, which officially ended World War I, imposed harsh terms on Germany. The German economy and political system were devastated. Unemployment soared, and inflation was so extreme that businesses began paying employees twice per day because prices rose so quickly that money became worthless. People needed someone to blame and minority groups, particularly Jews, became scapegoats. Anti-Semitism had existed in Germany for centuries, even though the Jewish population was small. In this chaotic environment, dozens of political parties emerged, each trying to convince the public that they could solve the country's problems. One of these was the National Socialist Democratic Workers' Party, better known as the Nazi Party, led by a young World War I veteran named Adolf Hitler. The Nazi Party platform promised that Germany would be restored to strength and glory by defeating its enemies, particularly Jews. Hitler and his associates advocated for the removal of so-called undesirables from German society and creating a country composed of what they called Aryans. The Nazis designed their party platform to exploit and increase the existing anti-Semitic beliefs held by many Germans to unite those who considered themselves to be Aryan against a common enemy, the Jews. The Nazi party gradually gained seats in local and regional governments as their message appealed to voters. Eventually, in the 1932 federal elections, Nazi representatives won roughly one-third of the seats in the Reichstag, the German parliament. The German president, Paul von Hindenburg, named Adolf Hitler chancellor, the second most powerful office in the country. Believing he and the other party leaders could keep Hitler under control. Instead, almost immediately, the Nazi leg Reichstag began passing laws to limit the civil, political, and economic rights of Jewish Germans. 
Over the 12 years of Nazi rule in Germany, over 400 anti-Jewish laws took effect. These laws stripped Jews of their citizenship and right to work in a wide variety of jobs, including civil service, medicine, and law. They restricted Jews from going to movie theaters, sitting on park benches, or owning radios. They prevented Jewish children from attending public schools or participating in sports teams. In large and small ways, these anti-Jewish laws made daily life increasingly difficult. The hope was that Jews would voluntarily leave Germany. Jewish people responded to these restrictions and resisted in creative ways. When Jewish children were no longer allowed to attend school or play on sports teams, communities opened private Jewish schools and started their own sports clubs. Here you see a Jewish field hockey team in Berlin in 1934. Even as restrictions on Jewish life were increasing, some still believed the threat would pass and the situation would improve. Others began navigating the complicated process of securing exit visas to leave Germany and entry visas to enter another country. The process was complicated, expensive, and could take years if someone was able to secure the visas at all. This is Walter Wohlmann, pictured in his German army uniform at the beginning of World War I in 1914. Walter served his country proudly, and he was equally proud of his family's Jewish heritage. As anti-Jewish laws took effect, his daughters were thrown out of school, and many of their non-Jewish friends stopped speaking to them. Still, when Lucille and her younger sister Susan drew cards for their parents to celebrate Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, they wrote the cards in both Hebrew and German. Lucille's parents made the difficult decision to send their daughter away in order to protect her. Lucille arrived in England on December 2, 1938, aboard the first Kindertransport, or Children's Transport. Approximately 10,000 children, most of them Jewish, were able to travel from Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia to relative safety in England over the next 18 months on the condition that they travel alone without their parents. At age 15, Lucille was one of the older children to be on a kindertransport, and she helped to care for the younger children during the journey. Lucille's British identification papers, which she received upon arriving in England, are seen here. At first, Lucille lived in an orphanage, but after a few months, she was hired as a nanny by an English family. She worked hard and was paid little, but she had a safe place to live. Of the thousands of children who were on kindred transports, Lucille was one of the rare few who was reunited with her family. The Woolman family was able to immigrate and build a new life in the United States. What prompted the Woolman family and so many others to take such drastic steps to send their children on a kindred transport? In November of 1938, after nearly six years of Nazi rule in Germany, Nazi persecution of Jews would escalate into a wave of violence called the November Pogroms, also known as Kristallnacht. On the nights of November 9th and 10th, 1938, bands of Nazi Party officials, Hitler Youth, and others carried out riots across Germany, Austria, and an area of Czechoslovakia called the Sudetenland, which had been occupied by Germany. Attacks focused on synagogues, Jewish-owned businesses, 
and Jewish homes. Jewish people were attacked and beaten. Thousands of windows were smashed. Over 7,000 stores were looted and hundreds of buildings burned, many of them while firefighters and members of the public looked on. Kristallnacht marked an important turning point. Previously, systematic harassment of Jews had been conducted using legal mechanisms through local and national laws to deny Jews' rights and limit their movements. Now, for the first time, large-scale violence was carried out against Germany's Jewish community. In addition, in the days following Kristallnacht, 30,000 Jewish men and boys from age 16 to 60 were arrested and put into concentration camps, marking the first mass arrest of Jews simply for being Jewish. Nazi government officials actually blamed Jews for the damage caused during the pogrom, and adding insult to injury, fined the Jewish community one billion Reichsmarks which was equal to $40 million at the time, and confiscated any payments made for insurance claims, causing Jewish property owners to bear the costs themselves. Here you see an invoice sent to businessman Walter Hesse for his assigned share of the damage. Walter and his wife Gisela were able to immigrate from Germany soon after. Although they had found safety, conditions would soon become even worse for the family members and friends they left behind. Some interesting questions and comments coming in in response to that video. I hope you're finding this informative and interesting already. Some of the things that I've received, uh, I'd like to address for the group here. Uh, there's a question about populations. What country had the most Jewish population, the largest Jewish population in Europe when the Second World War started, the Soviet Union and Poland each had over 3 million Jewish people. Germany had a bit over half a million. Uh, other countries, the Jewish population was smaller. Those are the largest three. I've got a note here that there's a newspaper, a British newspaper, I believe, called The Guardian, on their website, they ran an article recently about Viennese Jews who placed ads in the Guardian asking people to take their children. I hadn't heard about that. And I'm gonna be looking that up. Interesting point. Uh, another comment here, somebody had heard in a program, uh, one of the things that made Hitler hate the Jews was he wanted to get into art school and a Jewish art teacher wouldn't let him in. I've heard that it's one of many stories that have come out over the years trying to explain what happened here. Researchers have not been able to corroborate it. Uh, it's much more complex. It's, yeah, it's quite a question, quite a concern. We all want answers to that. Uh, some more questions coming in, even while we're doing that. Uh, question about our museum, is it privately funded or does it receive grants? Both. Uh, in the lobby, we've got a, a big wall of plaques for some of the private donations we've received. Uh, and I suspect we're out looking for grants too. Was there any public outcry or was it mainly after the fact that people realized how bad it was? As our story continues, 
you'll see that a big part of what the Nazi government was doing was getting Jewish people away from the rest of the population, which dampened or put a damper on any kind of public outcry. I think a lot of people didn't realize how bad it was, what was going on until years later. Uh, there's also a lot of denial going around. A uh, Couple of comments about other TV series. There have been a lot of programs, um, things that we will be addressing as we continue. Uh, I wanna clarify what I said about the population. There were about half a million Jewish people in Germany. There were over 3 million in Poland and the Soviet Union. Uh, pretty well corroborated numbers that the total of Jewish people killed in the Holocaust was around 6 million, along with millions of others too. Uh, the Nazis weren't focusing just on eliminating Jews but eliminating anyone who wasn't Aryan. More about that coming up. Uh, question about survivors. There are many survivors still alive. Our local community in Skokie still has thousands of people in our community. Yes, of course, they're getting pretty old. It's been over 70 years since World War II ended. Uh, we've got a big survivor community. And in fact, we have a speakers bureau at the museum. There are survivors and children of survivors who do presentations for museum guests and others. Uh, oh, some very interesting questions here. Let's see how we're doing on time. I'll get to these other questions as we continue. Some of them will be addressed in the content. Uh, so having said that, let's get into part two. Welcome to part two of your virtual group tour of Illinois Holocaust Museum's Carcomi Holocaust Exhibition. As in part one, we encourage you to take notes as you watch and listen. What was surprising or unexpected? What do you really want to remember? How do you think the people in these stories might have felt? What do these stories make you think about? What questions do you still have? At the end of this portion of the tour, your docent will answer your questions. We begin this part of our tour on September 1st, 1939. The German military invaded Poland from the west, and because of a secret alliance between Germany and the Soviet Union called the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the Soviet Union simultaneously invaded Poland from the east. The two countries divided and occupied Poland. With the German occupation of Poland, millions of Polish Jews were now under the control of the Nazi regime. Sam Harris, who was born in Dimblin, Poland, recalls, We sat at a table eating, and I heard noises outside. We ran outside, and there I saw airplanes flying around, chasing each other. The Nazis were shooting down Polish planes. I was four years old. Two days later, France and Britain declared war on Germany. World War II had begun. Within the countries conquered by the Nazis, policy would be driven by two commitments, Lebensraum, living space, and racial domination. The Nazi policy of encouraging Jews to immigrate was no longer practical. We will see how these policies changed and what that meant for Jewish people. Although Jews were a prominent focus of Nazi persecution, they were not the only group to be targeted by the Nazis. Dozens of groups were considered inferior 
or enemies of the Nazis, persecuted for different purposes and according to varied policies. Some groups were victimized for what they did, others for what they refused to do, still others simply for who they were. They were considered racial, biological, political, and social threats or burdens on society. Targeted peoples included Roma and Sinti, collectively known as Gypsies, Jehovah's Witnesses, Poles, and other Slavic peoples, homosexuals, political dissenters, and people with physical and intellectual disabilities. Members of these groups were harassed, imprisoned, and killed. In German medical facilities, including the hospital in Hadamar, Germany, doctors and nurses carried out a so-called euthanasia program in which children and adults with disabilities were killed because they were not considered to be worthy of living. These killings included experiments with poison gas, a method of murder that would later be used in the gas vans and gas chambers in killing centers in the East. Following the invasion of Poland in the spring of 1940, Germany quickly invaded and occupied most of the countries of Western Europe, including France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. An increased reliance on assistance from local populations and their governments enabled occupation authorities to quickly impose restrictions on Jews like those found in Germany. But whereas the restrictions were implemented in Germany over several years, in Western European countries, they took effect in a matter of months or even weeks. Rising persecution and discrimination was only hindered by a willingness of local citizens to resist German occupation and to assist Jews. In addition, Jews over six years of age in these countries were forced to wear identifying badges in the form of yellow stars on their outer clothing when out in public. In Germany, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands, the stars had the word Jew written in the local language. The badge not only was meant to brand and humiliate Jews, but also to segregate them, to watch and control their movements, and to prepare for deportation. In the first few years of German occupation, Jews in Western Europe faced limitations on their ability to attend school, earn a living, and move freely. However, as countries were conquered and the Nazis gained control over millions of Jews, it no longer became possible for Jews to voluntarily emigrate elsewhere. The Nazis instituted a short-term policy of isolation and containment of Jews. In cities and towns throughout Eastern Europe, Nazi officials created ghettos, designated areas of towns or cities where Jews from the surrounding area were forced to live in crowded, unsanitary conditions. Ghettos separated Jews from the broader population and cut them off from resources and potential aid. Food, medicine, and other resources were extremely limited and became even more scarce over time. Thousands of people died of starvation and disease. In each ghetto, the Nazis created a Jewish council, or Judenrat, to oversee the ghetto and to enforce Nazi rules and orders. Many council members attempted to soften the Nazis' cruelty but others were seen as weak and complicit. The Germans killed many council members for not meeting their demands. The true test for council members came when the Nazis ordered councils to identify ghetto inhabitants to be deported from the ghettos to forced labor camps or specialized concentration camps, now known as killing centers. Some council members complied but others refused and committed suicide or reported alone 
for deportation. Jews responded to this inhuman reality in a variety of ways. Even in the darkness of the ghettos, with the most limited resources, many Jews actively strove to maintain their dignity and humanity, and they resisted. Schools were created to allow children to learn in secret. Soup kitchens and orphanages cared for those most in need. People met clandestinely to pray and observe religious holidays. Art, music, and theater performances provided a mental escape and a sense of hope. Youth groups often led by young Zionists, gave teens and young adults a sense of community and purpose. Many of these groups would later become the core of armed resistance movements in the ghettos. Hundreds of underground newspapers, over 50 in the Warsaw Ghetto alone, helped people to stay informed of the progress of the war and dream of the day the Nazis would be defeated. Historians and others in the ghettos made efforts to document Jewish life in these extreme circumstances. The largest and most famous of these efforts was the Onik Shabbat archive, led by a Jewish historian named Emanuel Ringelblum. Hundreds of documents and descriptions of Jewish life and resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto were gathered for this archive, placed in metal cans and buried in the ground. Ringelblum and his colleagues wanted to ensure that even if they did not survive, the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto would be able to tell their own story. 19-year-old David Graeber helped to compile the archive, and he included his own last will and testament. In it, he states, What we were unable to cry out to the world, we buried in the ground. I would love to live to see the moment in which the great treasure will be dug up and scream the truth to the world. Smuggling was essential to survival in the ghettos. In some ghettos, including in Warsaw, children were able to move in and out through gaps in the ghetto walls, bringing back food for their families. Teenagers and adults could move in and out of the ghetto through the sewers, providing access to not only food, but medicine, information, and even weapons. Teenage girls, in particular, acted as couriers. Using false identity papers, these brave young women would travel between cities bringing news, documents, and information to inhabitants of the different ghettos. These couriers were the first to bring news of the killing centers and the truth of deportations to the ghettos. We will learn more about the killing centers in Part 3 of this tour. Adam Starkoff, whose wedding picture you saw in Part 1 of this tour, smuggled food and medicine into the Warsaw Ghetto through the sewers for his family, which now included his wife Pella and their baby daughter, Joanna. Adam wanted to find a way to get his family out of the ghetto, so he formed a plan. Pella gave Joanna medicine that put her in a deep sleep that made her appear dead and placed baby Joanna in a coffin. Pella then went to the ghetto gate to ask permission to bury her baby. When ordered by the guard to open the coffin, Pella told the guard that the baby had died of typhus, a dangerous and contagious disease. Afraid of getting sick, the guard waved Pella through the gate to go to the cemetery. Meanwhile, Adam had snuck into the cemetery and made arrangements for a caretaker to leave a ladder near a wall where the family could climb out to the Aryan side of Warsaw, outside of the ghetto. Adam was able to obtain false identity papers from the Polish underground, and the family spent the rest of the war 
living as Christians in a small town outside Warsaw. Because of the danger that the family would be discovered to be Jewish and reported to the authorities, little Joanna was not told the truth about her identity and did not know she was Jewish. Adam, Pella, and Joanna were not the only family who was able to escape from a ghetto. Four-year-old Sephora Fuchs Katz lived in the ghetto in Simiatych, Poland, with her family. When rumors of a deportation circulated, Sephora's father took her and fled the ghetto with his brother Benjamin and Benjamin's wife and three children. Little Sephora was wrapped in a blanket given to her by her mother to keep her warm. The family made their way through the forest outside their town until they came to a farm owned by Mr. Luchinsky. Uncle Benjamin knew Mr. Luchinsky and had previously done him a favor. The family was allowed to hide in the root cellar on that farm. They ended up staying in the root cellar for 22 months. Seven people hiding in a space so small that only little Sephora was able to stand upright. Sephora's father passed away from the difficult conditions while they were hiding. When the family was liberated by the Soviet army in the summer of 1944, Uncle Benjamin and his family kept Sephora with them, going first to Romania before immigrating to Palestine, which would become the State of Israel. The only thing Sephora was able to keep to remember her parents was that blanket, which had torn in the root cellar. But Sephora's father sewed up the tear, and you can see the stitches here along the top. When Sephora talked about her blanket, she often described it as her mother's arms protecting her, and the stitches were her father's protection. Sephora's blanket was the first artifact donated to Illinois Holocaust Museum to create the Carcomi Holocaust Exhibition. I'm receiving a lot of very interesting, insightful questions here. Uh, and I realize I'm running a little past my scheduled time here. Let's see what I can address and what I can refer to you. Uh, we've had questions, why did Germany lose World War II? What was their agenda? A very complex issue. Um, it would take several minutes to address that and there's a lot of good written material around. Uh, I recommend some research. Visit our museum, we can go into it in a little more detail. Uh, question about if the Germans wanted the Jews to leave, why didn't they just ship them out? Too many people, too hard to do. Uh, the, a big part of the laws you've been hearing about was to get people to leave on their own but eventually that just became untenable, <clears throat> Impra impractical, untenable, impossible. Uh, that led to some of the horrors you're learning about here today. Uh, why was England the country that welcomed the children? Uh, there were a lot of countries that just said, no, remember the world was in a depression and most countries couldn't find jobs and employment and resources for the people who were already there. Somebody in England decided to reach out beyond that. Couple of questions about Holocaust denial. I think I'd better address that. Uh, many people have said, this is so horrible, it can't be true. It couldn't have happened. People don't want to believe, don't believe, can't believe. We have a museum with hundreds of visible artifacts, tens of thousands of other research items, other museums, other researchers since the 1940s have been documenting in many ways the Holocaust really happened. 
and the overwhelming documentation and evidence that we have for that should be enough to satisfy any deniers. Those who insist on denial, I don't know how to answer further. Uh, question about eugenics, another interesting topic related to all of that. Uh, question about Sapora's parents. You heard about her father dying in hiding. Her mother lived a while longer than that. Question about teenage diaries. Well, of course there's Anne Frank's diaries. There are others too. Uh, another one of those questions that comes up a lot, is it true that Hitler had some Jewish ancestry? No, researchers have found no evidence. Many other good questions here. I wish I could sit and chat with all of you and each of you for hours. We have a lot more material to show you today that will help answer some of your questions. I hope stimulate some more questions and we'll talk a little later about how you can come visit us and learn more firsthand. In part three of our presentations, we'll get into the expansion of Nazi occupation across Europe and the implementation of what they called the final solution. Um, again, our host in the film will introduce some general questions. You're raising some very good specific questions too. Keep thinking, keep listening, and keep asking. I'll help you learn just as much as I can today. Let's move on to part three of our video. Welcome to part three of your virtual group tour of Illinois Holocaust Museum's Carcomi Holocaust Exhibition. As in parts one and two, we encourage you to take notes as you watch and listen. What was surprising or unexpected? What do you really want to remember? How do you think the people in these stories might have felt? What do these stories make you think about? What questions do you still have? At the end of this portion of the tour, your docent will answer your questions. We begin this part of our tour on June 22, 1941. After invading and occupying most of Central and Western Europe, Nazi Germany turns its attention eastward, breaks its alliance with the Soviet Union, and invades Soviet territories, including Soviet-occupied Eastern Poland. As the German army advanced, specialized units, called Einsatzgruppen, followed. They were charged with a specific task, rounding up Jews and killing them in mass shootings. This marked the beginning of the so-called final solution to the Jewish question. The name the Nazis gave to their plan to kill every Jewish man, woman, and child. Approximately 3,000 members of the Einsatzgruppen, aided by local collaborators, carried out killing actions in eastern Poland, the Baltic states, Belarus, and Ukraine. These were so-called ordinary men who became efficient killers. More than 2 million people were murdered in this way, nearly all of them Jews. As members of the Einsatzgruppen, carried out their grisly task, shooting individuals one by one and face to face, one bullet at a time, plans were already underway to create a more efficient method of killing, one that brought the victims to the killers. In January 1942, 15 high-ranking Nazi officials gathered at a villa outside of Berlin for a meeting now known as the Vance Conference. Their purpose? To coordinate this new phase of the final solution, using train cars to bring victims to specialized killing centers where victims would be killed using poison gas. The Nazis envisioned that 11 million people, 
every Jewish person still alive in occupied Europe and North Africa at the time would be murdered in this way. Deceptive language was a key element of this new plan. Jews from across Europe were told they would be resettled to the East or relocated, when in truth they were being deported to killing centers and concentration camps. Few Jews could truly comprehend what was going to happen to them, and deceptive language from the Nazis helped to persuade Jews that if they complied with the orders, they would not be harmed. Packed into boxcars, without seats or windows, dozens of people were crowded together, sometimes for many days, without food or water, and with no indication of their destination. Many people did not survive these journeys. Those who did were greeted at their destination by a chaotic scene. Nazi guards shouting orders in a language few of the deportees understood, separating people according to age and gender, and tearing apart families. At camps known as killing centers, arriving prisoners were moved almost immediately to gas chambers, where they were killed using carbon monoxide or an insecticide called Zyklon B. At two of the six killing centers, Auschwitz-Birkenau and Majdanek, arriving prisoners went through a selection process. Most were still chosen to be killed immediately, including children, older adults, and those considered to be unfit for labor. A small number, though, were chosen to live a bit longer, to perform slave labor. These prisoners had their heads and bodies shaved. They were issued a striped uniform and were given an identification number. At Auschwitz, most of the prisoners then had the number tattooed on their arm. Those who performed labor received meager rations and endured harsh conditions, freezing cold in winter, oppressive heat in summer. Disease and lice were rampant in the camps as prisoners struggled to stay alive while working difficult or dangerous jobs, often for 12 or more hours a day. Some of the assigned jobs produced materials for the German war effort. Other jobs were meaningless tasks intended to wear down the prisoners mentally and physically. Although opportunities for prisoners to fight back were rare and dangerous, people still resisted the Nazis by continuing to pray, by helping each other, and by staying alive for another day in a situation designed to destroy them. After being deported from her native Czechoslovakia, 13-year-old Fritzi Frischal arrived at the chaos of Auschwitz-Birkenau. A Jewish prisoner, whose job was to help unload arriving prisoners, known as a capo, whispered to Fritzi that when the time came, she should say that she was 15. Although she did not understand at the time, that capo was the first person to save Fritzi's life. Because she said she was 15, Fritzi was among the prisoners selected to perform slave labor, while others, including Fritzi's mother and younger brothers, were sent to be killed in the gas chambers. Soon after, Fritzi was selected again, this time to be one of 600 women to work in a factory making parts for German airplanes. The other women in the factory chose Fritzi, the youngest of the group, to be their messenger to survive, and to tell the world about their experiences. Every night, 599 women would line up and give Fritzi a crumb from their tiny ration of bread to give her extra nourishment and to help ensure her survival. With her help, Fritzi did survive, and she continues to tell the story of the brave women in that factory. In part two of this tour, you learned about the couriers who brought information from the outside world to people in ghettos. 
These couriers brought news to the ghettos of the killing centers and the Nazi plan for mass deportations, and many ghetto inhabitants, particularly young people, realized that their only chance for survival was to fight. On April 19, 1943, the first day of the Jewish holiday of Passover, an uprising began in the Warsaw Ghetto. Hundreds of teens and young adults, malnourished from years of mistreatment in ghettos and armed primarily with makeshift weapons, fought back against the German army. Many fighters were killed, but they successfully disrupted the planned deportations. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising lasted for nearly a month, longer than any of the countries of Europe were able to withstand the German army. The uprising inspired similar uprisings in other ghettos and even in some of the killing centers. Jews also fought back against the Nazis across Europe, from Belgium to Belarus, as partisans, organized groups secretly fighting against the Nazis. Partisan groups attacked Nazi supply trains, blew up bridges and factories, and attacked strategic and military targets. With few arms and limited ammunition, they used their knowledge of the terrain to their advantage and carried out most raids at night. As many as 20 to 30,000 Jews, many of whom had escaped from ghettos, joined partisan groups in the forests of Eastern Europe. The largest of these was the group led by Tuvia Bilski and his brothers. Their dual goal was to fight against the Nazis and to help as many Jews as possible to survive, even those who could not fight. This so-called family camp eventually became a small town in the forest, with kitchens, a school, and an infirmary. Over 1,200 people survived as part of the Bilski family camp. At the killing centers, a very small group of prisoners were made Sonderkommando, whose job was to assist the Nazis in bringing prisoners into the gas chambers and later disposing of the bodies by cremating them. Sonderkommando worked in this way for a relatively short period of time before being killed and replaced by newly arriving prisoners. Incredibly, Sonderkommando at three of the six killing centers, Treblinka, Sobibor, and Auschwitz-Birkenau, staged armed uprisings. At Treblinka, survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising inspired the revolt. At Sobibor, the last remaining Sonderkommando from the Belzhats killing center arrived to be killed, and those at Sobibor knew that their fate would be the same. The prisoners decided they would rather die fighting. At Auschwitz-Birkenau, young women who had been part of resistance groups in the Warsaw Ghetto successfully smuggled gunpowder into the camp, which the Sonderkommando used to damage or destroy four of the five main gas chamber buildings. Before being hanged for her role in the plot, Rosa Robata's last words to her fellow prisoners were the inspirational motto of her youth group. Be strong and have courage. More and more <clears throat> excellent questions coming in. You're a very thoughtful, attentive audience, and this is wonderful. Um, I'm glad we can all learn so much from what we're hearing today. Uh, some of the other comments I want to address, people are comparing what they're hearing from history with what they're seeing around them in today's world. That's why we study history. That's why we say, remember the past, transform the future. Some questions are going to be addressed in the next segment, or I'll get to them 
myself as we continue. Some people asking for reference works or recommending reference works, a lot of good information available. Uh, questions about the museum. The museum is open. I'll talk some more about that in our wrap up later on. Now, some of these I'm going to let our narrator address or I'm going to get back to. Uh, again, keep thinking, keep listening, keep learning. I'm glad you're here. Let's continue with part four. Welcome to the fourth and final part of your virtual group tour of Illinois Holocaust Museum's Carcomi Holocaust exhibition. As in parts one, two, and three, we encourage you to take notes as you watch and listen. What lingering questions might you have? At the end of this portion of the tour, your docent will answer your questions. We begin this final part of our tour on a more hopeful topic, individuals who risk their lives to help others to survive. Many of these individuals have been named Righteous Among the Nations, the highest honor granted by the Israeli government to a non-Jewish person. One of these rescuers was a teenage girl named Marie Catherine Rossi, later known as Kate Lipner. Kate lived in Nice, a city in southern France. As a teen, Kate joined the French Resistance, providing false identity documents to Jews and leading them across the Alps on foot to safety in neutral Switzerland. When Kate's mother passed away, Kate stayed home to care for her younger sister. She still wanted to help, as the treatment of Nice's Jews was becoming worse. Kate took in three Jewish children to live with her and her sister in their one-bedroom apartment. Under Kate's care, all three children survived. For her brave actions, Kate was named Righteous Among the Nations in 1995. She is also honored on the Pharaoh Fountain of the Righteous at Illinois Holocaust Museum. While Kate and other rescuers did their best to help people to survive, the war raged on. As the Soviet Red Army advanced from the east, the Nazis began destroying evidence of the killing centers and concentration camps. Remaining prisoners were forced west toward the German Reich, mainly on foot, in what would become known as death marches. In part, this was an attempt by the Germans to prevent prisoners from telling liberators what they'd experienced in the camps. The Nazis also believed that relocated prisoners would continue to produce armaments for the German military as forced laborers. Thousands died of exhaustion and exposure. Before the war officially ended on May 8, 1945, Allied armies liberated concentration camps across Europe. Allied forces had come to defeat their enemies, not to liberate prisoners. Their encounter with Nazi camps and prisoners was accidental. Even to battle-weary soldiers, the horror and sights were unimaginable. Jerry Glass, pictured here, grew up in Chicago. When he learned that his Russian Jewish grandparents had been killed in the Holocaust, he dropped out of high school and enlisted in the army as a 17-year-old. A member of the 3rd Army Division, 259th Infantry, Jerry landed on Omaha Beach in the third wave of the D-Day invasion and fought in the Battle of the Bulge, one of the bloodiest battles of World War II. Even as a battle-hardened veteran, Jerry was unprepared for what he encountered 
as one of the first American soldiers to enter Mauthausen concentration camp in Austria. As Jerry said, as a soldier, he knew what he was fighting for. But until Jerry saw the conditions at Mauthausen, he had not fully understood what he was fighting against. For the survivors, liberation was bittersweet. Many had no homes to return to, and most had lost some or all of their family members. Many of the survivors made their way to refugee camps, known as displaced persons or DP camps, several of which were converted concentration camps. In DP camps, survivors regained their physical health and attempted to locate surviving family members. Many got married and had babies, starting new families to help fill the gap left by family members who were lost. They also undertook the slow, difficult process of gathering the necessary documentation to immigrate to a new country, with the majority eventually settling in Israel and the United States. Twelve-year-old Aaron Elster survived two years in hiding, alone, in an attic in Nazi-occupied Poland. After liberation, he eventually ended up in the DP camp at Neufreimann, near Munich. A persuasive child, Aaron befriended the American soldiers stationed there. He began to learn English and honed his salesmanship by selling items on the black market. With the help of a Jewish refugee assistance program, Aaron was able to immigrate to Chicago along with his older sister, Irene. After the war ended, the victorious Allied governments, the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, sought justice for the horrors committed by the Nazis. They created a process and a precedent for international law that is still in use today. In November 1945, just six months after Germany's surrender, the International Military Tribunal brought charges against 24 high-ranking Nazi officials that included crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, war crimes, and conspiracy. The defendants represented a range of German leadership political and military leaders, but also leaders in the business community and the press. The three highest officials in the Nazi government, Adolf Hitler, second-in-command Heinrich Himmler, and propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, had committed suicide and thus did not stand trial. Between 1945 and 1949, a series of additional trials took place in Nuremberg to prosecute doctors, judges, businessmen, and high-level government officials. Many of those found guilty received only short prison sentences or no penalty at all. Trials continued throughout the 20th century and are ongoing even today, yet most of those responsible escaped judgment. In part two of this tour, you met little Sephora Katz, who hid for nearly two years in a root cellar. Here she is, pictured on the left, as she appeared several years later. After being liberated by the Soviet army, Sephora, her uncle Benjamin, and her aunt and cousins would eventually immigrate to British Mandate Palestine. Sephora worked hard in school and earned good grades. When she was in high school, her family decided to send her to live with relatives in Chicago, where she would have better academic opportunities. Sephora became a nurse specializing in geriatrics. Since she never had the opportunity to care for her own parents in their old age, she wanted to give that gift of care to other families. In Chicago, Sephora built a new life including her husband Marty and daughter Simona, seen here as a baby. Earlier in this tour, you also met Adam and Pella Starkov, 
and their daughter, Joanna. After the war ended, the family made their way to the DP camp at Feldefing, Germany. Joanna attended kindergarten and even performed in plays. One of her performances is seen here. Joanna is third from the right. Adam worked for the United Nations Refugee Agency, and through his contacts, he was able to secure visas for the family to immigrate to Chicago. Adam hoped that from the United States, the family would be able to move to Israel. But Pella knew that once they established roots in Chicago, that would be home. Adam and Pella took the oath to become United States citizens in 1950. Like the Starkoffs and Sapporah, many survivors came to the Chicago area after the war, and many of them came to live in Skokie, a diverse and welcoming community. Skokie provided an opportunity for survivors to live the American dream. Affordable houses, good schools for their children, and the opportunity to form a community with other survivors. This safe haven was threatened, however, when a group of neo-Nazis attempted to hold a rally in Skokie in the late 1970s. The village of Skokie denied the permit, and the neo-Nazis sued for violation of their First Amendment rights. As the case made its way through the courts, eventually ending up at the United States Supreme Court, the survivors of Skokie and around the world made a decision. They would no longer be afraid. They needed to speak out and tell the world what they experienced during the Holocaust. They would tell their stories in schools, public libraries, churches, and synagogues, and eventually in Holocaust museums. By hearing the survivors' stories, each member of the audience would become a witness to the events of the Holocaust. By taking this tour and learning the stories of Adam and Pella, Lucille, Walter and Gisela, Sam, Sapora, Fritzi, Kate, Jerry, and Aaron, you too are now a witness. We encourage you to remember what you have learned and share it with others. We must remember the past, transform the future. Thank you for joining us for our Carcomi Holocaust Exhibition Virtual Group Tour. We hope to see you again soon. What you've been seeing and hearing today is very much a summary of all that we can present at the museum, which is yet another reason to encourage you to come visit. We'll talk some more about that in a few minutes. Of the many insightful questions, comments, suggestions that have been coming in, there are some I particularly want to address here. Let me fix my throat. A couple of people asked about open exhibits and what's available. Uh, our, our rail car, our authentic rail car was mentioned earlier. That is part of what you can see, what you can experience when you come in. Several people have commented on, could it happen again? Uh, could, yes, genocide keeps happening around the world. We keep saying never again. We keep saying, remember the past and transform the future. And we have to keep active because things keep happening. It's why this learning is so important. It's why being an upstander, as John mentioned at the beginning of the first video, is so important. We need to stand up for 
each other. We need to stand up for ourselves. And it's a big part of the lessons we are teaching here. Uh, there was a question about recording for various copyright and publication reasons. We cannot replay recordings of the museum. We encourage you to come in and take a tour yourself, encourage other people to come in and take a tour, visit our website, keep enjoying, keep appreciating, and keep participating in virtual sessions like this. Our website has lots of information about that, ilholocaustmuseum.org. We have opened the museum to the public Wednesdays through Sundays from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. If you're in the area, please come see us, see our additional exhibitions too, our 3D holographic theater, uh, the rail car, our newest temporary exhibition, Mandela Struggle for Freedom, other exhibits that we keep posting from time to time. As you can tell, there's a lot to see and experience. We offer and we gladly schedule group tours and school field trips. And again, our website at ilholocaustmuseum.org will provide more detail on how to contact us for that. Tickets are available on our website. They must be purchased prior to your visit. That's among the safety protocols that we have thoroughly carefully implemented. We want you to be able to feel comfortable and safe visiting our museum and our website details what we're doing for that. Donations to the Illinois Holocaust Museum are always welcome and we very much appreciate them. You can donate through our website, look for the big orange donate button right on the homepage and that should help a great deal. I posted a link to our survey in the chat. I posted the website itself, ilholocaustmuseum.org. Uh, some other things too, including the discount code for our legacy shop, which is also available online. So I want to thank all of you for your attention and your good questions making this so valuable for me and I hope for all of you. Your insight helps me learn and helps me know how to help you learn also. Kate, is there anything else you'd like to add? Not at this time. Thank you very much. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. I hope all of you enjoyed it. Um, you all had wonderful questions. Everybody was respectful. That's what I like to see. Um, I hope you guys will join us next week when we visit the Art Institute. Um, you can sign up on your library's online events calendar. Until then, thank you again, Bill. Thank you, Ron. And thank you to Anna at Crystal Lake for helping us moderate today. Everybody have a good day.